This video was supported by an educational grant from Healthmark. And special thanks to Frank, Marie, and their teams for their incredible work and collaboration on these studies. Hi, I'm Christina Hopkins. My background is in environmental health and infectious disease, and I'm a research manager at Ofsted & Associates, which is a company that specializes in conducting real-world research in order to support improvements in patient safety and occupational health. Now, I'm here today to talk about splash and droplet generation in sterile processing and endo decontamination units, because we all know that those droplets really aren't stopping at that three foot line, right? Now look, there are a lot of one room or processing suites out there that look a lot like this one, meaning a dirty area that extends three feet back from the sink, and then that magical tape line functioning as a barrier between the dirty side and the clean side. Now, doesn't that seem crazy? Personally, I'm not gonna be eating my lunch on this clean side, and we've heard from techs in the field that droplets splash outside that three foot splash zone all the time. But nobody has ever systematically looked at and documented how far splashes really go in decontam. So that's what we did. Another reason why we were so interested in this is because we'd heard about outbreaks associated with sinks in other settings. One study found that running water in the faucet in a patient room hit the bottom of the sink and sprayed everywhere, picking up microbes and sending them at least three feet away. Now this caused a 36 patient outbreak and killed 12 patients. So we wanted to investigate this idea of water hitting the drain and then spraying all over. So we put some fluorescent glow germ around the drain in our office sink and then ran the faucet for 15 seconds. And here's what it looked like. The water hit the glow germ around the drain and scattered it all over the place. Now imagine if that were bacteria like we'd find in a decontam sink. And so then we wanted to expand upon our glow germ experiment with some real world research. So we partnered with two brilliant frontline sterile processing supervisors, Marie Brewer from Iowa and Frank Daniels in Virginia. Together, we sought to answer these questions. First, which activities generate splash? Now, everybody knows that droplets go flying during certain activities, but no one had ever actually documented it. So that's where we started. We also wondered about where and how far droplets in decontam unit went when dirty medical instruments were being manually cleaned whether or not PPE worn by techs and others in the unit gets wet. And finally, does the PPE work? Does it actually protect people in the unit from getting exposed? To answer these questions, we wallpapered Frank and Marie's units with this blue moisture detection paper that turns white when it comes into contact with water. Now this is what it looked like at Frank's site. We'd be able to see any splashes on the counters, floors, even vertical surfaces for a pretty big area around the sink to the right. To help us analyze the data later, we use labels to indicate distances from the sink, like three feet above the sink, our cart at four feet, or the pipes on the wall at six feet. Now we wanted to protect the study teams and make sure that they wouldn't actually get exposed to contaminated instruments or dirty water during the study. So both teams terminally cleaned and disinfected the units before putting up the blue paper, and we only used high level disinfected or sterilized instruments. And we found that manual cleaning activities do, in fact, generate splash. In fact, almost every activity generated at least a little bit of splash from filling up the sink, cleaning and rinsing scopes and probes, using the spray arm, transporting manually cleaned endoscopes to the AER, pretty much everything except running the ultrasonic sink. And sometimes it was a lot of fine little droplets, like during sink filling. Water from the faucet hits the bottom of the sink and splashes back up and all over everything. Now it takes a few seconds to show up, but can you see those little white dots form on the backsplash in this video? Remember the glow germ in our office sink. Anything in the sink is going to end up all over your workstation. So it's important to clean your sinks and workstations between every case and to keep this stuff around the sink to a minimum so that you don't have lots of gear in the splash zone. We saw a lot of variation in droplet sizes from the fine droplets in the video on the previous slide to these big, huge splots all over the workstation after rinsing an endoscope and all over the tech at the sink. At Marie's place, using a power sprayer generated a ton of splash. And at Frank's, cleaning and rinsing a transvaginal ultrasound probe threw water everywhere. Now, can you see how the droplets on the blue paper here have basically just melded into one big white streak on the counter? and that there's standing puddles of water on the mat at the tech's feet, not to mention how soaked the tech is. We attributed this to two key components of the IFU. First, 
the probe can't actually be fully immersed during cleaning. And second, the probe needs to be rinsed for two full minutes under running water. Now think about what happens when you rinse something grounded like a spoon under the faucet in your kitchen sink. It shoots water everywhere. And when water hit the grooves and surfaces of the probe, it soaked everything. Now, in addition to whether or not manual cleaning caused splash, we wanted to know where and how far the splash went. Is the three foot tape line reasonable? No, definitely not. At Marie's site, using the spray arm, which they do to remove dried blood, tissue, and other gunk, and to clean the sink, droplets went flying at least five feet. <clears throat> and can you see this little square of blue paper on the wall here? That wall is five feet from the center of the sink, and there were droplets all over. And while there were droplets, big droplets towards the bottom, we also saw a lot of visible droplets towards the top of the sheet, suggesting that these droplets probably would have gone even farther if the wall wasn't in the way. And after the study at Marie's place detected droplets five feet out, we decided to set things up so that we could track droplets even further. When we ran through the activities at Frank's site, we saw droplets hit a cart at four feet, the wall at six feet, and we even saw a couple of droplets on the floor at 7.2 feet. That's more than double the three foot splash uh, zone that we're used to hearing about and exceeds even the four foot one that we sometimes hear about too. And not only that, but we also tested a few other ways that fluid gets transferred around the unit. At Frank's site, they use a processing system that involves placing a clean scope onto a cassette for rinsing and then using that cassette to transport the scope to the AER for HLD. Thing is, that scope and that transport cassette are dripping wet after rinsing, and so it's not surprising that droplets fell on the floor all the way from the sink to the AER. Another way that droplets get trans uh, transferred around the unit is on technicians' feet. So you've seen the wet floors earlier in this video, and we actually saw wet footprints on the blue paper over 13 feet away to the door of the unit, and actually even outside of the unit too. So what that means is that whatever gets on the floor in decontamination unit is getting all over the hospital. And not only do droplets get all over the unit, they get all over the techs. Here, Maria is using the spray arm to rinse a stainless steel basin, and the whole front of her torso and the front of her arms got absolutely drenched. It also got up on her face shield and even up under her face shield on her mask. Now this is concerning because the face masks used in sterile processing units are almost never fluid resistant. And now that's not such a big deal when everything is clean like our experiments, but it's a very big deal considering how dirty and contaminated instruments are when they come down from procedures. There's just no way around the fact that the splashes that techs take every day are almost certainly contaminated with bodily secretions and germs that could transmit infection. We saw the same thing at Frank's site. Here's the aftermath of one cycle, and this is just one cycle of cleaning and rinsing one transvaginal ultrasound probe. The text drenched from head to toe, and you can see that her gown is completely soaked, even around the blue paper. Now, luckily in this case, it was a high quality gown, so the water didn't seep through. And now importantly, it's not just the techs who are working at the sink who are at exposure, risk of exposure to splash. This is what Frank looked like after standing a couple feet to the side of another tech who was cleaning a probe. And even though he wasn't doing anything at the sink, he still got splashed all the way up to his chest. And here, Frank was actually standing where he might be when he was training or observing someone at about three feet. And again, he had droplets even up on his belly. And now remember this, when personnel and visitors from outside the unit want to come in and insist that they don't need PPE. Now clearly everyone who enters decontam is at risk of getting splashed and should be wearing full PPE. So how well does it work? Well at Frank's site we evaluated shoe covers. Here they actually put the blue paper inside of the shoe cover to see if any water got inside while cleaning and rinsing a probe. And when Frank took his shoe cover off, you can see how the water actually seeped through the shoe cover and onto the bottom of his shoe. And the top got splashed pretty well too. One of his techs actually doubled up on shoe covers and put blue paper on the inner one and then put another shoe cover over the top of it. Look at how white the strips are. There's a lot of water getting through that shoe cover and it would have gotten on the top of her shoe if that blue paper and the extra shoe cover weren't there. 
It's also worth noting that her ankle area got wet, supporting the use of tall shoe covers or boots that provide protection up the leg, just like what's commonly used in ORs. We also found that head covers don't provide protection when Frank told us he could actually feel droplets raining down on his freshly shaved head right through the head cover. When we tried to document it by putting blue paper on the hat he wore under a head cover, we found one droplet that appeared to wick through. It does leave us wondering if head covers, which historically have been used to keep hair out of the sterile processing workspace, also need to be designed to make sure that they protect workers from exposure when they're working on the dirty side. At Marie's site, we also found that how well PPE fits affects how well it works. So when Marie was wearing gloves that were the right size for her, very little fluid managed to seep over the top of her glove, even though she had her hands completely submerged in the sink. When the glove was too big, however, water went over the top of her glove when she was cleaning the scope under the surface of the water and her arm got soaked. And I just wanna take a quick moment to get a quick reality check here. We did these splash experiments in clean SPD units with sterile or high level disinfected instruments, but that's not the reality for day-to-day -day work in decontam. Instruments come down from procedures heavily contaminated, and it's inevitable that splashes generated while cleaning those instruments are also going to be heavily contaminated. Now, while our studies didn't look at the risk of microbes, two recent studies have found that decontam units are covered in them, including one where environmental samples were collected from units where duodenoscopes were decontaminated, and pathogens, pathogens, were found in the manual cleaning sink, on the floors and the floor mats in front of the sink, on the mats in front of the AERs, and in the AER rinse water. They also found the exact same germs on the duodenoscopes, so the question is whether a dirty unit contaminated the scopes or whether dirty scopes contaminated the unit. Now, frankly, I don't love either option, and the findings emphasize that the importance here is of protecting workers in this area. Okay, so let's revisit those research questions from the top. Which processing activities generate splash? Almost all of them. Where do droplets go? All over the place. We saw splashes out to seven feet, and droplets got tracked all over and out of the unit. But what about PPE? Well, the tech at the sink is exposed from head to toe, and others in the unit are at risk of getting hit by droplets, even if they're outside of the area that we used to consider the three or four foot splash zone. And finally, does the PPE work? No. <laughs> Issues with fit, fluid impermeability, and coverage all put techs at risk. So where does that leave us? Well, as a field, we've made a lot of decisions about how workstations and units are designed, where things are stored, and what safety measures are appropriate based on an understanding that droplets only travel three, maybe four feet. These findings completely upend that, and we have a lot of rethinking to do. So if you're watching this from the front line and wondering where you can start, consider what you have around your sink. Does it need to stay clean? Consider what policies and practices you can put in place to help protect your workers, as well as what changes you can make to your PPE inventory. <clears throat> and finally, consider how you can keep what's on the floor in the decontamination unit from getting all over the rest of the hospital. If you're watching this from industry, ultimately the responsibility uh, for innovations needed in this area is going to fall largely to you. We need better sink and faucet designs and barriers to prevent splash dispersal. We need um, new automation and we need better fluid resistant wearable PPE. Now, the truth is that we're really just embarking on this line of research. And so while we found a lot of issues, we haven't yet found a lot of solutions. And we'd love to continue doing research in this area. So we'd love to hear from you about what your biggest concerns are because there's a lot more work to do in this and we wanna make sure that it's really grounded in the real world need. Because SPD is ultimately the heart of the hospital and responsible for protecting patient safety. But in order to do that, we need to make sure that we have evidence-based solutions to protect our workers at the same time. This video summarizes findings from our two studies on splash and decontamp. If you're interested in learning more, we have a free one-hour continuing education webinar available on our educational portal. 
This webinar covers the findings from our first splash study with Marie and goes into more detail about potential actions that you can take right now. We've also published two peer-reviewed papers discussing the findings of both splash studies if you're interested in more detail, and all of these are linked below in the video description. Here's a list of references if you would like to read further. Thank you for watching this video. We hope you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel. For more information, visit our website or contact us by email at education at offsetinsights.com. This webinar was supported by an educational grant from Healthmark. Healthmark provided our team with the blue droplet detection paper shown in the photos and financial support related to the development of this video and the CE webinar. Please contact Healthmark directly for information about their products and educational services at www.hmark.com. And finally, here's a list of disclaimers that you should read before making any changes to policies or practices at your facility.